Hi class, as we're headed towards the end of the class, I like to share some kind of parting thoughts as far as what we learn and then what's ahead. So first I wanna to get to kind of doing a debrief on the app design assignment. And I know many of you work towards having a platform app um, as a way to think about, you know, a service or a product you're trying to sell. And so thinking about platforms is basically a marketplace, right? Think of Alibaba, think of Uber, think of Airbnb and Facebook, Netflix, et cetera. And so these are not companies that have been in existence for a long time. They actually didn't exist 20 years ago. However, they're all the biggest or the most valuable companies in the sectors that they serve, right? So Uber is the biggest taxi company, even though they don't have vehicles. Airbnb, Airbnb has more, a bigger valuation than Marriott and Hilton, even though they don't own the real estate. And uh, Netflix, they're not cable companies, they're not the studios, right? Even though they have the biggest platform for shows. Um, and same with Alibaba. Alibaba brings together buyers and sellers for products that are made in China. So these are platforms that allow transactions. Remember back earlier in our introductory lecture, I had talked about what marketing means. It allows us to exchange, right? Exchange products and services. So given that's the case, and we have many platforms that we're looking at, like I said, um, these are the fastest growing platform slash companies, even though they don't own nearly as much real estate or assets or cars or even employees, right? So how is that possible? Well, that's getting back to how we think about what a business or what a marketing function is for some of these companies or apps that you guys were designing. And so in terms of thinking about the app design, I'm sure some of you have thought about, well, what does make a good app or what does make a good business or a good platform to run? So basically three ideas, uh, and this comes from this book called Business of Platforms from one of my professors back at Harvard Business School, um, Professor Yaffe. Um, so if you wanna learn more about it, be sure to check out the book, The Business of Platforms. So start with, obviously, <laughs> this is probably obvious, needs no mentioning that to have a good app or to have a good platform or to run a good business, um, be sure to think of a good product or service, right? To run or to um, have as a service for your customers. And so I think my, Professor Yaffe's criticism of Uber is that even though it's a big scaled business, it does not make it a good long-term business in the case of Uber because, and he gets into this in the book that in order for Uber to have grown as much as it did, the investors basically have been subsidizing the rides, right? So even though they're bringing together the Uber drivers and the Uber riders, it's taken a lot of investment and subsidizing in order to make that business scalable and as fast growing it has been. But at the end of the day, it's still a taxi service, which isn't a high margin, high growth business, right? So second point in terms of growing a platform or a business is to target what we call market failures. In other words, places that have been ignored or not served well by the current players. So look for companies that you have to spend a lot of time searching or you have to spend a lot of time paying the transaction costs and there's a serious supply and demand imbalance or some other inefficiencies. So one of the examples he gave in the book about business of platforms, there's actually a rented chicken business and um, not sure that's a market failure because we can all get chicken somewhere. In fact, I was recently in Hawaii. You can actually catch a wild chicken just on the road somewhere. So the market failures, I think, is required, right? This is the part that's hard to do, to think about where the market is failing the consumers and where you can provide better efficiencies. And so thinking back to how Amazon got started, um, Amazon looked at how bookstores 
right, are all over the country. And in fact, Barnes and Noble is one of the biggest players. Um, but Amazon thought that they could develop a way to ship books cheaply and get it to consumers quickly and develop a marketplace where the, the buyers of books can easily find ways to get books to them, to, to, to buy the books quickly, right? Or to compare notes about what books are good or what books are not good. Um, so they started with one side of the platform, right? Which is the book readers. So again, when you think about the apps that you've designed, usually it's hard to think of both sides at the same time. Usually it's not so easy to service both the booksellers as well as the book buyers. So Amazon started with just thinking about the book buyers, right? Starting with the one side and look for inefficiencies and found a cheap um, and a good way for book readers to find these books and then get them to get the, these books to the book readers quickly. Um, the third tip is to think about when you launch this business, how are you gonna grow, right? And this is why social media, everybody talks about social media, social media, especially digital marketing, right? We're leveraging what we call these network effects so that when somebody joins Uber, not only are they taking a ride, they're also kind of sharing the Uber experience with some of their friends, right? And same with the Uber driver that joins Uber. Typically, they would spread the word of mouth effect and get other drivers to join Uber. So that's the network effect where each person that you add to the platform, it's creating more and more value to that platform. So you can imagine back to thinking about your apps. And I always ask the chicken and egg problem, right? If you're trying to start an app for Uber drivers, you have to get at least, you know, a couple hundred Uber drivers, right? In order to sell the Uber service to the Uber riders. So you have to develop these network effects where people, like I said, chicken and egg, right? Grow the Uber driver side in order to allow Uber riders to, you know, access the app and then get those rides. So the network effect, I, I think it, this is in chapter, uh, our lesson six or seven, but, um, you know, again, I would rec uh, recommend the book if you wanna learn more about how network effects allow the social media companies and the companies I just showed in the first slide to have grown so quickly without the real estate, without a lot of assets, without a lot of employees. Okay, so next, um, what are some ideas for how to grow this platform business, right? So a lot of you have had good ideas about the four Ps in terms of how to you know, develop, develop your product or service better to suit the customers, to promote it properly on the Apple or on the Android platform, to distribute it, right? Again, on those um, mobile platforms. And then lastly, to prices such that your app, it will be readily accepted and adopted. So how to build it? Number one, as I said, in Amazon's case, they chose to service the book readers first, right? So, you know, who are you gonna help or service first in your platform business if indeed you have a marketplace where you have sellers and buyers coming together. And then number two, the chicken and egg, right? How do you grow the Uber drivers such that you have enough Uber drivers to service the Uber riders, right? The chicken and egg, figuring out which side, or maybe you wanna service both sides eventually. And then number three, design your business model. So where do you make the money? So in the case of Uber riders and Uber drivers, I have to say, unfortunately, the Uber riders have also been subsidizing us, right? Because the investors put in the money, the riders are getting these taxi rides for cheap. But in fact, the Uber drivers are using up their cars, right? They're paying for the maintenance of the car. They're paying for gas. They're finding out, gee, it's not so economic to, to run an Uber driver business, is it? So again, think about where you want to help you know, do you want to help the, the sellers of the, biz, the services or you want to help the buyers of the services? And then should one side pay or subsidize, subsidize the other side? And I would argue that in Uber's case, um, 
probably neither side should be subsidized, right? It, that's the true marketplace where it's truly efficient and nobody's having to subsidize the other side. So anyways, that's my um, view of how a two-sided platform should work well, at least in the long term. And then lastly, make sure you enforce rules. So we have all heard horror stories about how Uber drivers, you know, did not behave. Um, or there's also Uber, Uber riders who did not behave, right? So we have to, well, in these platform developers have to find ways to enforce and make sure these providers, right? So you see this on Amazon or on eBay too. You have some sellers who will deliver bad products or you have some sellers that are scammers. And so in order to be a, an effective platform, you have to make sure your ecosystem attracts the right kind of sellers and also attracts the right kind of buyers. Okay, so my last point is, and this is back to how we think about pricing, right? The last part of the four Ps. So in these platforms, um, multi-sided platform is what MSP means. So general principles for multi-sided platform to think about which side is willing to pay more in order to have this service. So in the case of us using our credit cards, we're also being subsidized by the restaurants, by the hotels, by the vendors, because they are less price sensitive. So even though like they charge what, 3%, the merchants are willing to give up the 3% in order to attract more restaurant goers and more hotel um, guests, right? But if we have to pay 3% more, think about how we buy an airline or buy a hotel room. You know, if there's a 3% price increase, it's very possible we would just rather not use that service, right? So the merchants are more likely to pay for this convenience, right, of having a credit card um, uh, payment process. And then same with Airbnb. If we have to pay 3% more for our Airbnb rooms, it's very likely we'll just go to another hotel or maybe stay at a relative, right? But then the Airbnb hosts who have the rooms or the houses, they're more willing to pay the 3% because, um, you know, in a month, they have 30 rentals maybe, right? So the 3% to them is worth it to keep attracting more clients through the Airbnb platform. Okay, so thinking about pricing, so that's a good one, right? Thinking about are my customers sensitive to price changes? And that's what we mean by price elastic. Number two is to think about how to price it so that the, the side that cares more about having this service are the ones that we can charge more with, right? So unfortunately you see this at nightclubs. The nightclubs will have the women, attracting young women go in for free, but then the men who are going into the nightclubs have to pay, right? To, to, to even just um, be in the room, not even have, be in the clubhouse, not even having um, pay for a drink yet. Um, and same with dating sites. Dating sites usually charge the men and the women get a free ride, right? Because they want to attract more women onto the platform. Um, you also see this with a freelancer platform called Upwork. So the freelancers, the freelance graphics design or digital artists, they're more of the starving artists, right? So they're willing to pay in order to get on the platform where they can be noticed and where they can be hired easily. So the last point about pricing is to think about charge the side that's willing to, or that's able to extract more value, right? From having a platform to work with. So in the case of open table, even though we can get reservations, it's very easy for a restaurant goer to just call another restaurant, right? But then the open table restaurants who sign up for the service, they're willing to pay because again, just like what we said about credit cards, they're willing to pay to get on these platforms such that they can attract and advertise on more platforms, right? And make it easier, right? To, to make the convenience and the ease of finding this restaurant more accessible. 
And then Fandango, the movie um, uh, site, movie ticket securing site, uh, it's actually the moviegoers that have to pay because as a moviegoer, I'm not gonna call 10 different movie theaters in order to find out what movie's playing and buy a ticket and make sure I have a seat saved for me. However, um, Fandango uh, finds out that basically the movie theaters, um, they can have their own, like AMC can have their own website, right? But then the smaller theaters might be more motivated to be on Fandango because then again, the movie goers can find the seats and then be able to secure a reservation more easily. So open table, again, the restaurants are the ones that can get more value out of it. Whereas in Fandango, the pain and suffering of having to call 10 different theater would you know, motivate the movie goers to sign up for something like Fandango because it's more of uh, an easy process, right? To secure a seat and make sure you have a movie to go to and then that it's not sold out. Okay, so I think that wraps up what we learned in our class in terms of thinking about how you want to develop a business, how you want to market it, and then what the marketing function is in thinking about something like an app, right? So I hope that that's something you're going to bring to how you present the case study answers back to me. So again, think about the business of what the company in the case study is trying to solve, and then how can the various marketing frameworks help them figure out the five C's in terms of what the company's doing, what the competitors are doing, how are the customers changing, who are the collaborators, the collaborators they can best work with, and then the context of the political, the economic, the social, and the technological trends that are affecting how that product's being sold. And then obviously thinking about the four Ps, the marketing mix, when the trends are changing, the customers are changing, how can the four Ps be readapted in order to better suit what that company is trying to do? Okay, that's all I have. And uh, be sure to let me know any questions um, before you, uh, well, obviously while you're reading the case study, but also as you're answering them, be sure to let me know if you have any questions because usually the questions you have um, is very relevant to everybody else in class too. So I definitely welcome that. Just make sure you're not sending me questions late into the night on the day it's due. <laughs> okay, so good luck. And I look forward to reading uh, the case study answers you're gonna send me.